Hello folks, I'm Alan for today's news. I will be reading and speaking about world news, interesting news, news to keep you entertained and news to keep you informed. What I got for you today is uh, from Hunt, Hunker? No, not that one there. Okay, what I got for you today is Business Insider. Ukrainian special operators are learning to fight Russia without the tethers other militaries have gotten used to. Ukraine's military has grappled with logistical challenges throughout the war with Russia. Ukrainian special operators in particular have been learning to fight without those tethers. The U.S. military is also preparing for a future where opponents can challenge its logistics network. Ukrainian special operations units have played an important part in their country's defense against Russia over the past 15 months. But operating against an adversary that is larger and, in many cases, better equipped has required Ukrainian special operators to learn to fight without the logistical tethers that many militaries, including the US and its allies, have gotten used to over the past several decades of warfare. Full many Ukrainian leaders were skeptical that Russia's military would invade, even after months of buildup along Ukraine's borders. When Russia launched its attack early on February 24, 2022, Ukraine's government was caught off guard but the Ukrainian military wasn't. Ukraine's armed forces had been preparing for another war ever since Russia seized Crimea and stoked a separatist movement in the western Donbass region in 2014. Since then, Ukraine has waged a deadly low-intensity conflict against pro-Russia fighters and their Russian advisors in the Donbass. Eight years of warfare taught the Ukrainians that a major Russian invasion would put extreme pressure on their logistics and that resupply of frontline units would be difficult, so the training provided by the US and other NATO countries has focused on the basics. Continue reading. Okay, you're going to read the rest of this in my description box if you like. I'm going to go to my next one here. This one's cool down. Amish families have figured out an ingenious way to dry clothes without household appliances in the winter. Here's how they do it. Line drying is a no-cost way to use the sun's energy to dry clothing, which makes it a great choice for people who are trying to save money and electricity. But some homeowners who want to use clotheslines worry about what they'll do in the winter, luckily, the Amish have this problem figured out. The Scoop This hack comes from Amish 365, where journalist Kevin Williams has documented the Amish and Mennonite recipes and culture he has studied for the last 30 years. During the warmer months, there's no more iconic image of Amish country than dancing, colorful clothing flapping on the line, drying in the breeze, he said. Despite common perceptions of the old-fashioned Amish, modern technology sometimes appears in these communities. Some now use e-bikes, and Williams said that some own gas clothes dryers. Although, I will say that's unusual, the exception rather than the rule, he added. Instead, most Amish families rely on clotheslines in the summer, and they still work in the winter, Williams said. According to appliance company Speed Queen, drying on a line in winter is actually a form of freeze drying thanks to sublimation, or ice evaporating from a solid state. Wet clothing may freeze, but the moisture evaporates into water vapor leaving behind dry clothing that just needs a little loosening. In other words, being frozen doesn't keep water from evaporating out of clothing. Many Amish families take advantage of this fact, Williams said, but others prefer to hang their clothing indoors in the winter. They may hang clotheslines out of the way in the basement or arrange drying racks over wood-burning stoves. One popular item in Amish communities is a bicycle wool dryer, which Williams explained is a drying rack for small items like socks, towels, and head coverings. It's made by hanging a bike wheel so that it lies on its side, then suspending clothespins from it. Some families use similar compact hanging drying racks made from plastic. Why it's great. Hanging clothing, even in winter, is a reliable way to save money on laundry. With this method, homeowners don't need to own a dryer and won't need to spend money on gas or electricity to power it. Clothes that are dried outside also smell great without using chemical-laden dryer sheets. Saving electricity this way is also good for the planet. The lower the demand for electricity, the less power plants need to generate, and the less pollution they produce. This helps reduce the heat-trapping gases in the atmosphere to stop the planet from overheating. What people are saying. Williams received comments from readers with personal experience with line drying in winter. When I had lived on a farm, I did, said one commenter, adding that the clothes smelled better that way. 
Another user pointed out that this method isn't just for rural homes. I grew up in suburban Detroit, and I have childhood memories of a clothesline in the basement with clothing drying on it in the 1960s, they said. When I had my house in the summer, I would uh, hang them outside because they actually do smell better, you know, and they feel softer, in my opinion. And um, I've never done it in the wintertime. And uh, I don't know about hanging them out in the wintertime. Anyway, some uh, homeowner association uh, won't, won't let you do it if you're in a homeowner's uh, association. But I'd rather hang my clothes outside. Anyway, let me go to the next one here. This is from a tasting table. What is a cowboy st uh, cut steak and what sets it apart from regular ribeye? Steak night's a good one, well-prepared slab of beef seldom disappoints. Yet while the meal requires only one star ingredient, it does require a bit of know-how. From which cut to choose to how to cook it, a lot of effort goes into the perfect bite of beef. So next time you're inspecting the selections at the butcher counter, avoid disappointment by going for a cowboy cut steak. Also known as a tomahawk or delmonico, this large hunk of beef is a dependably tasty steak. This particular cut, which is usually in hefty sizes of 18 to 32 ounces, is actually part of a ribeye. However, unlike a normal ribeye, not only is the cowboy cut steak twice as thick but the bone is left in, too. The amount of bone varies based on the type of cowboy. When most of the rib is still attached, with the meat untrimmed, it's sold as a tomahawk. However, when the bones cut down, it's called a delmonico, which is still twice as thick as a normal ribeye steak. Regardless of the bone's length, its inclusion has many benefits, let's dive into why. Bone-in cowboy steaks offer better flavor along with other benefits. When selecting a cut, the flavor is undoubtedly one of the first considerations. Leaving the bone-in does improve the taste. By not debiting the steak, you prevent the meat's natural juices from leaking out. A shield against a primary beef woe, well-done meat, leaving the bone-in allows the interior to retain its juices, fats, and other components that all add to the meat's flavor. Additionally, the steak's thickness helps it from drying out or becoming well done but does mean the steak requires a longer cooking time. It takes nearly 10 extra minutes to grill a cowboy cut steak versus a ribeye, depending on thickness. Not only will the cowboy cut steak be less likely to dry out, but it absorbs more smoky flavor during cooking, too. Add in cowboy steak's delectable marbling, and you have quite a tasty cut. Finally, there's the visual factor. With the tomahawk cut, there's a viscerally appealing element to the protruding bone. Sure, this type of ribeye may cost a bit more per pound, but the splurge makes steak night memorable. Yeah, I used to work at a Walmart and meat department before, and they sold uh, cowboy cut steaks and uh, tomahawk, and then it's pretty big steaks. Pretty expensive, too. This one will be a, ta a tomahawk here, and this will be a, ca a cowboy cut steak right here. I'm going to go to the next one now. This from Business Insider. Ukraine's Defense Ministry sa says its Storm Shadow Long Range Missile have hit 100% of their targets. Ukraine's Defense Ministry tweeted that its Storm Shadow missiles have hit 100% of their targets. Britain gave Ukraine the missiles in May after Ukraine asked for longer range weapons. However, Russia also claims it's intercepted two of the Storm Shadow missiles, per Reuters. Full Ukraine's defense ministry said that its long-range Storm Shadow missiles, given by Britain, have successfully hit all their Russian targets. Storm Shadow long-range missiles have hit 100% of the targets identified by the general staff, the ministry tweeted on Sunday, attributing the information to Ukraine's defense minister Oleksiy Reznikov. And you can read the rest of this in my description box if you like. I'm doing this news, news late. Uh, the next one here is from Business Insider. Ukrainian forces scattered around Bugmut could retake the city after wet rat Wagner Group mercenaries evacuated and are replaced by regular Russian troops. Ukrainian forces around Bakhmut could retake the city after Wagner Group forces evacuate. 
The ISW suggests that Russian movement in the area is low, leaving openings for a Ukraine offensive. Ukrainian troops in Bakhmut said fighting regular Russian troops won't be as hard as Wagner forces. As Wagner Group troops evacuate Bakhmut, Ukrainian forces may have a chance to retake the war-torn city, but it's unclear if that will be Kiev's priority as a long-awaited counteroffensive looms. Russia claimed victory over Bakhmut earlier this month after a long and costly battle for both sides of the war. Shortly after, Wagner Group boss Yevgeny Prigozhin announced he would be withdrawing his mercenaries from the city on June 1 after Russia claimed full control of the city. Regular Russian troops will replace Wagner's forces, Prigozhin said. British explosive experts are teaching Ukrainians how to build can-sized bombs by hand. Similar technology was reportedly used to bring down a building on Russian troops in Bakhmut. If we have a high-priority target, we of course use this equipment against it, one fighter told CNN. Ukrainian soldiers fighting against Russia are reportedly being taught how to make powerful, can-sized bombs by British explosives experts. The weapons have been used to target individual Russian soldiers and bring down Russian-held buildings, according to CNN. If we have a high-priority target, we of course use this equipment against it, one anonymous Ukrainian soldier told the TV channel. His equipment is used to destroy the enemy, they added. We use it to produce explosive devices we can use on the ground, on the battlefield, or in the air as munition for drones. CNN's Nick Robertson describes the bombs as a secret weapon in Ukraine's army. Similar technology was also used to bring down a building on dozens of Russian troops in Bakhmut, per CNN. Russia claimed it had captured the destroyed eastern city last week, but Ukrainian forces are believed to be planning a counteroffensive. As well as teaching Ukrainian soldiers how to build can-sized bombs, the British experts are bringing key components, including switches, microchips, and 3D printers, to Ukraine, according to CNN. It tends to be faster for Ukraine to get key supplies via experts coming into the country than through its NATO trading partners. Leaked files published last month showed that the UK had the highest number of special forces personnel operating in Ukraine, followed by Latvia, France, and the US. The UK has also supplied the Ukrainian army with long-range storm shadow cruise missiles, NATO standard Challenger 2 battle tanks, and attack drones since Russia's invasion in February 2022. And that's all I got on that one there. Let me go my next one here. This from Business Insider. Western suppliers of weapons to Ukraine could escalate the war to a new dimension. Russia's ambassador to uh, the UK says. Russia will scale up its war if the West keeps supplying Ukraine with weapons, its ambassador to the UK Andre Kellen said Saturday. This escalation will get a new dimension which we do not need and do not want, Kellen told the BBC. His warning came as a top Ukrainian official said the country was ready to launch a counteroffensive. Full screen. Russia is ready to escalate its war efforts if the West carries on supplying Ukraine with weapons, the Kremlin's ambassador to the UK said Saturday. Andre Kellen told the BBC that Western military aid would prolong the 15-month conflict, and warned that the longer that dragged on, the more likely Russia was to scale up its attacks. That depends on the efforts in escalation of war that is being undertaken by NATO countries, especially by the UK, he said, in response to a question the fighting would last. Sooner or later, this escalation might have a new dimension that we do not need and we do not want, he added. It is a big idealistic mistake to think that Ukraine will prevail. Russia is 16 times bigger than Ukraine, Kellen added. We have enormous resources, and we haven't just started yet to act very seriously. Kellen's warning came the same day that top Ukrainian defense official Oleg Danilov told the BBC that the country was ready to launch a long-expected counteroffensive tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, or in a week. Russian politicians have repeatedly threatened escalation, most notably when President Vladimir Putin accused the West of nuclear blackmail in September last year. If the territorial integrity of our country is threatened, 
We will certainly use all the means at our disposal to protect Russia and our people, Putin said, appearing to hint at Russia using its own nuclear weapons. This is not a bluff. Elsewhere in his interview with the BBC, Kellen falsely claimed that Russia's war was merely a special military operation to depose a neo-Nazi regime, which he said had been set up in 2014. He also refused to acknowledge the United Nations documentation of Russian war crimes in Ukraine, and then said he was offended by interviewer Laura Quensberg's questioning when she pressed him on the subject. Okay, and that's all I got on that one there. Let me go my next one here. This from Business Insider. A secret Cold War era deal lets uh, British jets shadow Russian bombers when they fly near a vital Atlantic choke point. Since the 1950s, Ireland has allowed British jets to intercept Russian aircraft near Irish airspace. Ireland's west coast overlooks North Atlantic waters that the Russians and NATO keep a close eye on. The deal allowing the intercepts has long been secret, and Irish lawmakers now want more details. If Russian bombers fly near Ireland, they may be intercepted by fighter jets, but not Irish ones. Under a secret agreement between the UK and the Republic of Ireland that dates back more than 70 years, Britain will defend Irish airspace from intrusions by Russian aircraft and other aerial threats. The deal has been amended by Irish leaders over the years, but it has also been kept secret due to Irish memories of British rule and tensions over Northern Ireland, which remained a part of the UK after Ireland was partitioned in 1921. The deal now faces rising backlash, however. An Irish senator filed a lawsuit last year arguing the deal is unconstitutional. The growing power of Sinn Féin, an Irish Republican Party historically opposed to British influence, could also affect the future of the agreement. On the other hand, rising tensions between the West and Russia could jeopardize Ireland's traditional neutrality and challenge its meager military, which is primarily oriented for UN peacekeeping missions. There is growing alarm among the Irish public and its European governmental neighbours at Ireland's woefully neglected defence capabilities, Michael Mulqueen, a professor at Britain's University of Central Lancashire and an expert on Irish national security, told Insider. Continue reading. Sponsored content. Okay, and that's all I got on this one here. Let me go to my next one here. This is from uh, the Washington Post. A giant pal of logs is trapping millions of tons of carbon in Canada. A pileup of ancient logs nearly as big as Manhattan is trapping millions of tons of carbon in northern Canada, and much of that stored material could be released into the atmosphere due to climate change, according to a recent study. The fallen, jumbled up wood has in some cases been sitting for more than a millennium, protected from decay by the deep freeze and the tight packing of the logs, which are carried northward by the Mackenzie River above the Arctic Circle. And now, amid warming temperatures and rising seas, the log jam may be at risk of breaking up and decaying more quickly, said Alicia Sandrowski, a researcher at Michigan Technological University who led the study. Natural carbon sinks, such as forests, peatlands, and the ocean, are an important damper on climate change because they trap more carbon than they release into the atmosphere. Carbon sinks on land are estimated to soak up a quarter of the world's emissions, a powerful but not always well understood factor in slowing warming. Not all carbon stores are resilient to rising temperatures, though, and some may break down quickly when pushed too hard. Thawing permafrost starts melting slowly, then melts very rapidly, for example, leading to fears of massive releases of carbon into the atmosphere and a problem that builds on itself. Scientists are racing to map how much carbon is trapped in wood in the Arctic, and how much might be lost to the atmosphere as a result of climate change, as wood that has stayed stable for hundreds or even thousands of years starts to break down from warming temperatures. We don't have a big understanding, systemically, about other large wood deposits, Sandrowski said. A 20 square mile log jam. The massive accumulation of wood that she studied covers a total surface area of 20 square miles, scattered in deposits across the Mackenzie River Delta, the endpoint of a powerful river that sweeps across Canada. The profusion of wood may be storing about 3.4 million tons of carbon, according to Sandrowski's research work, which was published in the journal Geophysical Research Letters. It sought to map the log jam and estimate its weight and carbon content for the first time, using a mixture of drone and satellite photography and artificial intelligence to estimate the visible amount of wood. That's equivalent to the emissions of 2.5 million cars for a year, she said. 
The oldest wood Sandrowski found was around 1,300 years old, according to radiocarbon dating, she said, although most of it was less than 70 years old. She still isn't sure whether the logjam is losing carbon faster than it is accumulating it through new trees being washed into it, but she said the process was likely to start to accelerate. Live trees that have been rooted in the permafrost may increasingly tumble into rivers as the ground thaws underneath them. And warmer temperatures may accelerate decay as the logs rub against each other and shed more material and float off into the open sea, where they will decay more quickly than if they remain trapped in the log jam, Sandrowski said. Okay, and uh, there's more to read on this if you want to read the rest of it. And uh, you can tell Biden he can stick that where the sun don't shine. Let me go That's back. Body service and switch the spectrum one, see? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, the next one is from Hunker. Try this genius hack to prevent food from sticking to your girl. Grilling season is upon us and we're so excited. We're dreaming of grilled everything, corn, burgers, watermelon, chicken, yes, please. There's nothing quite like cooking and eating a delicious meal in the great outdoors. But, sadly, grilling isn't all fun and games. One of the most common grilling mishaps. Stuck on food. Food, especially lean meats like chicken, can easily get stuck to the grill grates if you're not careful. If that happens, you'll be left with a messy grill, ruined food, and an empty stomach. That's why we never fire up the grill without a potato in hand. Yes, a potato. And despite what you might think, it's not for eating. Slice a potato in half and rub the cut side on the hot grilled grates before tossing on your food. The starch in the potato will coat the grates and prevent food from sticking to them. You may need to slice the potato more than once to get the entire grill coated in a layer of starchy goodness. That's it. That's the hack. Happy grilling. Grilling. Okay, so you still use a Pam or anything. I don't use anything like that anyway. Uh, you can use potatoes. Interesting. And that's all I got for you uh, for news. Um, remember, I'm out for today's news. I will be reading, speaking about world news, interesting news, news to keep you entertained, and news to keep you informed. And uh, I hope I got something for you today. Until next time. Thanks for watching.